Hey everybody and welcome back. Fight Club is the greatest movie of all time and anyone who says differently is either a late 90s film critic or Jennifer Aniston. Probably. Fight Club is a movie I love so much that I will now, ironically, break its first two rules. I once had the pleasure of attending a lecture by Roger Ebert about Fight Club. I can't find a clip, but basically Roger Ebert said out loud to an auditorium full of Fight Club fans that The Sixth Sense is a better movie because when you rewatch it, there are no clues that would give away the big twist ending. Spoiler alert, Bruce Willis can't be killed. Now, I won't speak ill of the dead. Well, not fresh dead anyway, but mother fuck John Adams. But seriously, Roger Ebert, seriously? One of the greatest, most mind-bending things about Fight Club is precisely that when you rewatch it, they are telegraphing the ending constantly. On your second viewing, you cannot believe how stupid you were that you missed it. And yet you did. And so did everyone else. And that is self-evidently genius. To celebrate his genius, let us now recount all the ways in which Fincher telegraphs the ending, shall we? Exactly 30 seconds after the opening credits end, the narrator straight up tells us that he and Tyler share the same mind. I know this because Tyler knows this. The first subliminal Tyler appears as punctuation to the line, With insomnia, nothing's real. Everything's far away. Everything's a copy of a copy of a copy. Because Tyler is both not real and a copy of Jack. Jack tells us that he regularly blacks out and wakes up with no memory of what he's done. I nod off, I wake up in strange places, I have no idea how I got there. So at a minimum, we know he's living a double life. The second subliminal Tyler appears directly on the word pain, because Tyler is the psychic manifestation of Jack's pain. That's pain. The third subliminal Tyler punctuates the phrase, we really open ourselves up, because he exists inside of Jack. The narrator tells us that, like Batman or an 80s blue-collar rock star, he becomes a different person after dark. Every evening I died, and every evening I was born again, resurrected. Marla asks Jack his name, and the movie cuts away before the audience hears the answer. We later find out that she knows him as Tyler. Tyler Durden, Tyler Durden, you fucking freak. So that's the answer he must give here. The first moment we see a superliminal Tyler, the narrator says, If you wake up at a different time, in a different place, could you wake up as a different person? And the moment Jack finally meets Tyler is the very moment that he creates Tyler. He has a psychotic break in which he hallucinates his own death by midair collision, passes out, and wakes up to find Tyler sitting next to him. Jack dies, and Tyler is resurrected. In fact, the moment of Tyler's official entrance into the film is a visual metaphor for his creation. First, we see only Jack, as if he were alone. Then the camera moves, revealing Tyler, who has been in the background all along. Tyler appears to literally emerge from Jack. This is the moment of Tyler's birth. Fincher uses the same blocking again later to represent Tyler lurking in Jack's subconscious throughout the movie. And then... We have the exact same briefcase. They have the exact same briefcase. When Jack calls Tyler, no one answers because you can't dial seven real digits into a real phone and expect your imaginary friend to answer. You can, however, imagine that a phone rings and then hallucinate an entire conversation. Tyler knows the contents of Jack's living room. So fuck off with your sofa units and string green stripe patterns. Or the Ohanashav sofa with the string green stripe pattern. Tyler urinates in a Bon Marie of soup in front of an open door in full view of the entire banquet hall with no consequences. Because he's imaginary. This transit customer puts his hand on Tyler's shoulder and says, excuse me. Excuse me. But walks straight through Jack. Because now Tyler is the real one and Jack isn't there. Near as I can tell, when Jack is just following along, acting like a sidekick, that's when he's embodying Tyler. When Jack is resisting Tyler, arguing with him, that's when he's really himself. Tyler feeds Jack dialogue like a bizarro world Cyrano de Bergerac with six-pack abs and frosted highlights, except Tyler isn't hiding in the bushes, he's just sitting in the room with them, being super obvious about it. He fell down some stairs. He fell down some stairs. When Jack is on the phone with Marla, Tyler is lurking in the background, 
in Jack's subconscious, just doing some crazy alter ego shit for no apparent reason. Why? Because Jack is talking to a pretty lady. Tyler is Jack's testosterone cranked up to 11. Marla is bewildered when Jack is surprised to see her because Jack is Tyler and they have recently had sex. If we rearrange these scenes so that they're in chronological order, we can watch Jack leave the frame as himself and then return as Tyler. We are inside Superman's phone booth watching Clark Kent become Kal-El. Marla asks, Did I call you? Not because Tyler is a different person, but because Jack's personality has changed so drastically. He is effectively a new person and Marla is meeting his alter ego for the first time. But, and this is important, she rolls with it because it's still just Jack. And this is one of those moments that is so small but so important because how else could this movie work? Why on earth would someone just invite a stranger into her home and then leave with him without any explanation whatsoever? Well, we make the woman a strung out junkie with low self-esteem and then have her seem to acknowledge that this is a different person in what appears to be a throwaway punchline. Did I call you? And the audience just rolls with it. It's called a changeover. The movie keeps going and you know what? Let's just, let's just move on. Marla doesn't know who else could possibly be in the house. Who are you talking to? Shut up. Tyler knows the content of Jack's private phone conversation. Just tell him you fucking did it. Marla casually grabs Jack's genitals because Jack is Tyler and they have recently had sex. Marla is nonplussed by Jack's rude behavior because Jack is Tyler and they have recently had sex. When Jack is confronted with the Fight Club related paraphernalia that he left about the office, he panics. He's caught red handed and he, as Jack, has no idea how to deal with it. Faced with this extreme stress, he becomes Tyler before pontificating about his own chaotic mental state. Because the person who wrote that is dangerous. And then brazenly threatening his boss. The narrator confirms that we just witnessed a changeover. Tyler's words coming out of my mouth. Marla asks Jack to check her breast for lumps because Jack is Tyler and yeah, okay. Marla is hurt by Jack's indifference toward her because Jack is, I feel like we get this one. Bob believes Fight Club was founded by only one man. Do you know about Tyler Durden? and has heard rumors that Tyler is an insomniac who was born in a mental institution. He was born in a mental institution and he sleeps only one hour a night. In other words, Tyler is a creation of Jack's sleep deprived psychosis. Apropos of nothing, you know Bob's full name is Robert Paulson. Jack is reminded of his first fight with Tyler. Marla doesn't understand Jack's use of the plural pronoun us. Us? What do you mean by us? Marla doesn't hear Tyler speaking. This conversation. Tyler speaks directly through Jack. This conversation is over. Is over. The space monkeys don't understand why Jack doesn't know about Project Mayhem. The space monkeys answer Jack's question to Tyler because there's no one else in the car he could be talking to. All right, yeah, why wasn't I told about Project Mayhem? First rule of Project Mayhem is you do not ask questions. And finally, after the accident, Tyler, who was driving, climbs out of the passenger seat. Jack climbs out from the driver's side because that's where he must be. Because in the driving scene, Jack is resisting, making him the real one, and his imaginary friend can't drive a real car. There's a story about this in the DVD commentary. Apparently, when the editor got to this scene, he called Fincher and he told him he needed to reshoot it because he had the guys climbing out of the wrong sides of the car. Fincher told him to finish editing the movie and then call him back. So if the editor couldn't figure it out, maybe the rest of us can be forgiven too. What clues did I miss? Let me know in the comments. Please like and subscribe, and should you feel so inclined, you can check out my brand new Patreon page. I would love to make a video every month, or even dare I say it, every couple of weeks, but views don't buy diapers and the wife don't buy excuses. So if you feel like throwing me a Pampers whenever I post one of these, please check out the Patreon. Thank you for watching. Hey, you guys know the narrator isn't really named Jack, right?